Okay, here we're going to look at natural selection and how it relates to behavior. So starting out, uh, natural selection and binocular vision. So behavior in this sense, we're looking at how an uh, animal in this case has its eyes oriented. So binocular vision is having two eyes and being able to perceive an object in 3D. There's five main advantages to having two eyes versus only one. When you have a backup eye, in case something happens to the left or the right, you have the other. Wider field of view, depth perception, ability to see around objects, um, depending on the angle, and increased ability to detect faint objects. So this ability to see around objects, I want to think this is like a superpower, but if you kind of ever seen something, it might be blocking one of your eyes, and if you look it through the other eye, you're able to see sometimes around something that might be obstructing your initial vision. And the wild field of view and depth perception are all very important. How these relate is the position of the eyes. So eye position can help determine if the animal is typically a prey or a predator, and this can influence its ability to avoid one or find the other. So a pigeon tends to be low in the food chain and has a very wide field of view. The binocular vision area is very small, but its field of view is quite large. An owl being a predator has a reduced field of view, but has a greater amount of binocular vision. Some good animals to kind of compare on how their eyes might be oriented. All of these can be found around my classroom. The deer, no matter where you stand in the room, depending on, um, as long as you're not blocked by anything, the deer can see you. The raccoon and deer are both facing in the same direction in my room in particular, so that when you look and you can be seen by both, as you work your way around, the raccoon will no longer be able to see you at a certain portion, but the deer will always be able to see you. Give the example too of the aquatic species, the fish and the blue crab. We also want to be thinking about how their eye position is important. Natural selection behavior. Adaptive traits allow evolutionary advantages in different ways. Behaviors can reduce predation. Um, some birds will take the eggshell removed by gulls to reduce predation by crows to increase the camouflage of those eggs. Other behaviors can enhance energy uptake, can allow more offspring to be supported. Behaviors also can increase resistance to disease. Example here is eating a healthy diet can help reduce your incidence of getting disease. Other behaviors can enhance the ability to acquire a mate. Here could be the mating ritual or calls. Uh, if those are per perfected or performed well, they can increase the odds of finding and acquiring a mate. Natural selection behavior. Every behavior that offers a survival advantage, advantage for an individual comes with an associated cost. For a behavior to be favored by natural selection, the benefits must outweigh the cost. Give the example here of the penguin courtship, where the male penguin goes around and creates a nest of rocks, and the goal is to have a better rock selection than those around him, so that the female will select him. As an example here, cost and benefit ratio is involved with all walks of life, so the benefits must outweigh the cost, otherwise it's not advantageous for that species. Reproductive behaviors encompass a variety of animal behaviors, including courtship. Competition for mating opportunities has been termed sexual selection. Intra-sexual selection is where individuals of the same sex compete for a mate from the opposite sex. And this is usually males, and there's been entire TV shows dedicated to this. Intersexual selection is essentially mate choice, where the female is able to select what mate uh, they would like to have. So focusing a little bit more on that intersexual selection or mate choice for the female. The female is ideally looking for a male that provides the best offspring care, could provide the best territory, could provide the best genes. On the rams here, they will butt heads until um, the alpha male is determined, and the alpha male would be the one that gets the rights to the female. Here we see the example here of two individuals with different amounts of showiness to their feathers. This male has a little bit more showier feathers. This female selects that as a mate, and then you can see the resulting population increases the showiness of their feathers. And some other good uh, links to some uh, YouTube videos indicating showing this mate choice and intersexual selection. The typical number of mates an animal has during its breeding season is called the mating system. So monogamy is one male and one female, Polygamy is one male and many females, and this is more common in polyandry, which is with one female with many males. And you can see them, again, represented here. 
uh, what certain um, ape or monkey species might participate in one of these. Chimps are monogamy, one male and one female. And you could see here with one versus many, one male and many females polygamy, and polyandry is one female with many males. See, the polygamy is much more um, common in the um, world here of apes and monkeys. Altruism in group living. So altruism is the performance of an action that benefits another individual at the cost of the actor. So helpers at the nest in some bird species and um, centennial is a term for animals that give a predator alarm calls. Give the meerkat example here. It's a meerkat that specifically is on the lookout for, for potential harm to the community. They then sound a call and let all the individuals know. This comes at a cost to the individuals they are constantly scouting and needing to alert others. And this altruism is a behavior that's helpful to others, but clearly requires self-sacrifice. I give the example here of giving to the homeless. The existence of altruisms altru amongst animals is rather perplexing, and natural selection should operate against it because there's a cost to an individual. So this is where we get into the complexities of some of the behaviors of animals. Altruism group living. So altruism behavior may not truly be altruistic after all. The actor may have some sort of benefit. Nest helpers may get parenting experience or inherit territory. Um, Centels may be able to escape predators in the confusion following the alarm call. So that's the example of the meerkats. They might sound the alarm, causing everyone to kind of scurry around, not sure what to do, uh, and they may be able to escape the predators in amongst the confu confu confusion. And altruistic uh, compensates for a reduction of its own reproductive success by increasing that of its relatives. Selection that favors altruism directed towards relatives is called kin selection, kin referring to family. The more closely related two individuals are, the greater the potential genetic payoff. We have this here by this graph, which I think is great. Um, it shows helpers tend to be close relatives. Helpers assistance increase with genetic relatedness. So the probability of helping, the percent increases here, degree of relatedness. So the closer they're related, the more likely they are to help. You can kind of relate this if you're moving or need to be picked up from the airport, you're more likely to ask a full sibling or maybe a half sibling than you are a cousin or someone more distantly related to you. Hopefully this helps explain natural selection and some behaviors associated with that.